Okay. There we go. All right. Wait a second. A few things to do now. Right, cool, there we are. I hope the audio quality is all right. I hope everyone can see and hear me. And I'd say all settings are done. And yeah, I need Here's the stream, here's the top chat. Okay. Yeah, there we are. Welcome to our first Deep Sky Astrophotography live session. That means that I set up my astrophotography rig and um, behind me, it's dark, you can't see it. Um, it's a Skywatcher Newtonian telescope onto a um, Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount connected to my computer. Um, I'm sitting outside here with you in the dark and the cold. And I'm running uh, two different programs tonight here. Um, this is uh, Stellarium you're seeing right now. And with Stellarium we are going to um, going to move the mount and point it in the night sky. I'm going to plate solve in the background, meaning uh, taking short sub exposures and letting the software figuring out where we are right now. And then we take some exposures. And the goal of tonight is let's just stroll along the night sky. And uh, the idea behind all this is that uh, you decide what we try to capture next. So we won't capture like pitch perfect brilliant images, we are just going to um, step visit each target and just have a look at what is what's going to look like from our backyard. Um, galaxies, nebula, um, star clusters, open star fields, whatever you like, whatever you wish. You can download Stellarium, you can um, open it and you can stroll around the night sky and make suggestions in the chat room. And so with all that said, I slewed my telescope to Murfak. This is a star in the eastern part of the night sky from my location, just to, um, just to uh, focus my telescope, I needed a bright star, it took me frog, and then we can choose the first target of tonight. Um, Galaxy Ars Media, hi, yeah, Ewan from Galaxy Ars Media is in the chat, hi there, um, do you plate solve with EQ mod and Stellarium gear? I do it the old-fashioned way, so <laughs> I use a bunch of software parts um, patched together, but it works for me, so everything's fine. I use Stellarium to control the telescope, or rather the mount, and um, I use Astro Totilla uh, ver version 0 0.7. Um, this is a plate solving software um, that works independently and I can upload my um, taken images from my DSLR, import it, let the software figure out where I am and then resync the mount on the same instance. And yeah, then the uh, mount position is uh, resynced in Stellarium and I can re-slew the mount and then we are at our target within seconds. It's really handy, yeah. There are software solutions uh, embedding all that into one software group, but until now I was just too lazy to um, get used to any new software. So this just works for me and we will use it this evening. I hope I... Uh, could answer your question. I connected also with Stellarium, but I need to plate solve here. For example, use uh, Astro Tortilla 0 0.7. Astro. It's free, you can download it. It's, it's a bit of pain of the ass, uh, pain in the ass to, uh, to set it up. 
but you will figure that out. There are great tutorials out there for that. Okay, so now all we need is a first target and I'd say we take the the first thing over here would be a spiral cluster. It's just next to Murfag and we can just click and stroll over to the cluster. Why not? And then all we do is set current object and slew to this uh, cluster over there. Uh, we gonna see, yeah, this is uh, the indication that our mount arrived there. And now we do the following. We switch over to sharp cap, which is visible right now. Okay, 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 it worked. So this is not the cluster. I need to take a text test exposure. I will choose some totally arbitrary settings, let's say a 20 second exposure. And now we access our camera. Okay, by the way, in the chat room. Is the audio feed working for you guys? That would be important for me, whether the audio stream and the video stream works. From my perspective, uh, perspective everything seems to be okay. Yeah, and there we have it. This is a spiral cluster. Um, I need to open another window because over there. Okay. Because in the background, I try. I hear you. That's great. Okay, so what we are seeing right now is an open cluster. I try to grab another exposure, say, of 30 seconds, just to bring out some more star colors. So what we are looking at right now is an open cluster. That means these are stars. Um, these stars are part of our galaxy. So we are orbiting the sun, <laughs> obviously. And right now it's night time, so we are on the opposite side of the Earth. And um, our sun is mm, one single, lonely, average star within roughly 150 billion stars in the Milky Way. There you go, this is our second exposure. Okay, so and the Milky Way is a constellation of billions and billions and billions of stars. And uh, this star cluster right here is part of our Milky Way. So these are stars grouped together and normally formed uh, from the same origin. So they are, might have been a gas cloud billions of years ago and these uh, clouds do collapse under their own gravity and um, then stars form in average around the same time. So the, they have the uh, same age roughly, roughly speaking, so plus minus billions of years, and um, they are grouped together. And um, those star clusters are intermedium old and they got ripped apart by the gravitational pull of the Milky Way while they spiring around the center of the Milky Way. And yeah, they are the remnants of that um, rich and star-forming gas cloud, still grouped loosely together, maybe by gravity, um, and floating around in spirals around the um, center of the Milky Way, until they are ripped apart, like our sun, once was a member of such an open cluster out there. Okay, hi, there are other people in the chat room. Lucian, what will you see tonight? That's up to you, Lucian, it's up to you. Make suggestions, we will, um, we will stroll around the night sky and we will um, explore different uh, objects and you can choose, you can open Stellarium yourself, you can post something 
and um, I will just chit chat about astronomy in general and astrophotography and we'll answer some questions and we will see quite different sets of astrophotography or astronomy objects like open star clusters right now or we will see some um, some globular clusters or galaxies or even some some nebula <laughs> a, a puppy says hi <laughs> yeah hi little dog hi there okay fly me to the moon um yeah wait a second to update some settings and maybe take another another text exposure uh, test exposure okay wait a second okay Is the audio feed still okay for you? Am I too loud or too... I would like to see the Andromeda through a telescope. Uh, hit the like button everyone. Let's help Chris with this video so more people would see it. Thanks. Thanks Ewan. Okay. Yeah, we can stroll over to the Andromeda Galaxy for sure. This is a very um, popular target. Oh, why shouldn't it? It's very beautiful. Okay, so right here we're gonna see Stellarium. So we're right now here. This is the spiral cluster we are looking at right now. And then we will head over Almach, a bright star, and we'll see the Andromeda galaxy over there. So this would be the image of the Andromeda galaxy. And I can uh, input the uh, specs of my telescope within Stellarium, and this will roughly be the field of view. So you see that the Andromeda galaxy is quite big. So there's the bright core and all the gas around. And the Andromeda galaxy is somewhat like the like the twin sister of of our uh, Milky Way. So it has roughly the same shape. It's bigger though. It's contains somewhat between 200 billion and 300 billion stars, so a bit bigger. And um, yeah, but it's also a spiral galaxy. And this galaxy is obviously not within our own galaxy. So this is another galaxy we are looking at right now uh, from our backyard. Okay, <laughs> this is an image within Stellarium. And we choose, okay, the Andromeda galaxy, current object, and slew over to Andromeda. So my mount is working. And um, there we might be. I will try a test exposure with an astrophotography tool. This is the tool that controls my my um, DSLR camera. So I access my camera with this um, software and told my camera to capture a 30 second exposure, I think of the core of the Andromeda galaxy. And then we see whether my mount uh, was able to find the galaxy. Precisely, yeah, there it is, okay. That, that doesn't look like, like much, okay. Um, this is the core of the Andromeda galaxy you're seeing right now and right in the upper in the upper right corner there's a small faint 
uh, blob that is a, um, a satellite galaxy, M110, um, that orbits the Andromeda galaxy, actually. Um, I'm going to take another exposure with a lower ISO and bulb of, let's well, say, 150, 180 seconds. So that will take two to three minutes. Um, and meanwhile, I can talk about the Andromeda galaxy. So this right now would be what you could see with your naked eye when looking through a telescope. So I took a 30-second exposure with my camera and um, that would be roughly the equivalent of looking through the telescope. Um, so many people think when they look through a telescope they see something like this one here. So a bright, shiny, pop-up, poster-like image of a galaxy. This is not the case. So galaxies are very, very big. Normally, uh, the Andromeda galaxy seems to be very big in the night sky, but is very, very dark because the Andromeda galaxy is a few million light years away. So light with a speed of light travels millions of years until it reaches us. Thus, the, um, the brightness is very low. So our eyes need to, need to um, fetch as many photons as they can and that here would be the rough equivalent of what you'd actually see. Either way, nevertheless, you're seeing an object with your own eyes that is millions of light years away, which I think is just incredible. Okay, and um, these objects um, are called, uh, are called like M32 or M110. Um, this is a catalog name named after Charles Messier um, that was a comet hunter in the early days of astronomy and um, he hunted for comets. These were fuzzy blobs <laughs> seen through those telescopes back then and um, they were moving and um, people found them very exciting. So, and um, he discovered other fuzzy blobs in the night sky that were still and not moving. And he didn't, he had no clue what they were, those fuzzy objects, but uh, he knew they were no comets. So, he created a catalog of um, objects not to be um, accidentally mistaken with an um, or identified as a comet, so an, in, in some way an exclusion list. And those objects are now called the Messier objects in the Messier catalog and are one of the brightest or among the brightest objects in the night sky. Um, mostly deep sky objects um, and um, among them are star clusters, globular clusters, galaxies, um, nebula, bright constellation of stars, um, something like this. So, and the Andromeda galaxy is part of that list. Okay, and you see here very clearly um, in the middle the Andromeda galaxy, then on the um, bottom half uh, of the image uh, is M32, a satellite galaxy, and in the upper left uh, on the right corner there's a faint fuzz and this is the galaxy M110 and that was a three minute exposure of um, the Andromeda galaxy and so what we astrophotographers do is is we uh, do hundreds of those exposures or at least dozens of them and then we add all the information together because a three minute exposure reveals the core and you see um, slight shades within the nebula structure. These are the arms of the Andromeda galaxy and you see some surrounding um, gas and not much more. Not very distinct star colors and no, not a lot of structure. And we collect light after light after light 
an exposure after exposure after exposure and then we stack all those images onto each other and we don't want to do that tonight so we are just skipping from object to object this night and um, meanwhile i can scroll um okay lucian would like to see the whirlpool galaxy yeah the whirlpool galaxy is on the other side of the um of the sky right now but we could visit the whirlpool galaxy later on Ewan asked me what camera i use yeah my camera uh, it's i think it's in the in the video descriptions is a canon eos 700 da um, it's a um, DSLR camera and I uh, astro modified the camera. If you can move the camera higher we can see all of the setting of the images. Uh, yeah, that would be that would be not bad. Zack. Something like that. Okay. You one is right. Now you can see the camera settings. Okay. Sorry, cats. Um, a similar exposure on how you see through the eyepiece. Mm, yeah, roughly. So the first 30 uh, seconds exposure was something like you would see through an eyepiece. The images look so similar with a refractor, probably it needs brighter stars to see the spikes. Yes. Um, Ewan is referring to the um, Newtonian spikes that you see. These are. Um, artifacts that come from the um, the holding of the the secondary mirror there are there's a cross in front of my telescope and thus um, the images uh, can produce stars with spikes and uh, this is actually something very uh, beautiful but uh, we can we can image a bright star later on and we can see some Newtonian um, crosses. Okay, um, you want also Whirlpool, Whirlpool Galaxy was my first that I imaged. Yeah, it's it's a great, great galaxy. It's such a beautiful thing. Um, in what bottle sky conditions are you shooting? Um, I live in a small town, and uh, the bottle sky here is somewhere between five and six depending the evening conditions i i can't sure uh, say for sure can we see a nice globular cluster yeah amaui tolosa <laughs> excuse me if i mispronounce your name wants to see a globular cluster so our next target should be a globular cluster um galaxy ars media points out that uh, three minutes are nice yeah i'm using a um, scourger eq6r pro this is quite a heavy mount and so or a capable and sturdy mount so it can carry my uh, newtonian reflector with ease so i'm well under half of the max weight capacity so uh, now there's a car and we wait until the car is gone I can drink some coffee. And this is a very important part uh, aspect of astrophotography. So you need sturdy equipment if you want to produce a a long exposure of three to up to ten minutes. You need uh, equipment that's absolutely capable of handling all the weight of the um, extra equipment on top so um, i started with a eq3 pro mount that was cool um, but it was on its weight capacity and so all the stars were like trailing when i started to get up to two minute exposures and now i can um, take three minute exposures without even um, guiding so uh, ewan Right now I'm unguided because <laughs> it's just not necessary for three minute exposures. And I pull a line like perfectly with sharp cap and that's all I need to do. Okay. We wanted 
we will open Stellarium again. And uh, yeah, the camera orientation is is uh, it's roughly is this is what we what we got. Look at that. So I'm. Uh, this is M32 at the bottom and M110 at the upper corner. And if we see what we really imaged, it's roughly the same, even though, of course, with a single three minute exposure, uh, we don't gather all that detailed information about the galaxy, of course. Okay. Um, you can try even heavier telescopes, should handle the weight. Yeah, my EQ6R Pro could handle higher weights with ease. With my EQM 35 Pro I was able to get one minute without guiding at, whoa, one and a half meters. That is quite a quite an achievement. I can't recall the maximum weight capacity of the um, EQM 35. Is it somewhat like 10 kilogram? The EQ3 Pro I used had something, which I think, between 5 and 8 kilograms. Something like that. I, I can't, can't tell for sure. Okay. We want to stroll across the night sky and... Oh, there are the player Ds. Okay, later in this evening we, we must see them. I tried to find a um a glob cluster within our hemisphere triangulum because if we cross 180 degrees like this this line here is called the meridian. If we cross that, my telescope needs to uh, do a full a, a full rotation. Here would be the great star cluster in Hercules. That would be. This is one of the biggest glob globular clusters, but it's on the other side of the of the sky. So we're gonna search search for something over here. This is the pepper and salt cluster. This is an open cluster and this is the Pegasus R and M2 and Pegasus R uh, both behind. Okay, you know what? I think the the great cluster in Hercules is just within the in our field of view right now, so we just toggle current object, slew. I think I need to do a um, a um, plate solving step to uh, really center it, but whatsoever. 10 kilograms. Drift alignment, yeah, drift alignment is somewhat very diff or time consuming so uh, I use sharp cap and sharp cap works just perfectly fine for me but you need to have a straight view at at the um, north star so we take a 10 second exposure with um, astrophotography tool just to see where we landed so I think the um, Hercules cluster won't be... Oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> we were lucky, even though now I can uh, open that image with an astrophotography tool and then astrophotography tool will solve that and then tell me where the mount is actually pointing. So, you saw that? Our mount indicator drifted away and this is the actual pixel precise position of our mount right now. And then I can say 
Okay, no, current object, slew again, and then the mount centers that object dead on. And that's that. Okay, now we can head over to ADP. Oh man, I'm running so many programs simultaneously. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, and then we will do a... 30 second exposure for you folks. 30 second exposure, shoot. And we gonna see what we can pull out of this camera. How long you guess the exposure to reach a view like in Stellarium for Andromeda? Um, Nico, uh, we are talking about hours. So if the image shall look the same, processed then we are talking like four to six hours of uh, worth of exposure time at least uh, the the image contains so much nebulosity and and nebula data and stuff like that so this is at least the the amount of uh, time you need to spend on that target so okay this is not very pretty right now i will uh, shrink down the uh, iso and bulb 180 second exposure and in the meantime, we can talk about a globular cluster. Um, okay, we already saw an open cluster star field. That means that there has been um, a gas of a uh, cloud of gas um, back millions or even trillions of years ago, uh, <laughs> billions of years ago. And um, and stars formed within that gas cloud, and um, so the stars within that uh, con in within that object, they have roughly the same age, and are gravitationally um, linked together, and fly around the center of our Milky Way. So now we have a globular cluster. These are much more dense objects, so we're talking not about like a dozen or a hundred stars, but something like a thousand or ten thousand stars bound together by high gravitational pull and thus forming somewhat something like a spherical object. So globular clusters are very, very, very spherical because they are very heavily bound together by gravity because there are so many stars within that cluster. So each star will follow some orbiting path within that um, globular star uh, cluster and the cluster itself will remain somewhat spherical. Um, even though every individual star is uh, fiddling or flying around within that area of the night sky. Um, <coughs> so um, I read different stories about the origin of globular clusters. First and foremost, globular clusters um, are within or nearly within our galaxy. So. The open star clusters are totally part of a galaxy, even in the very close neighborhood, so 10, 100,000 light years away, somewhat directly within our galaxy. Um, globular clusters are not, so they're um, at the edge of our galaxy, spiraling around the, the galaxy, so they are somewhat in an orbit around our Milky Way. And uh, one of the stories I uh, read was that the globular clusters are um, remnants of old galaxies or baby galaxies and all the gas and the, the fainter stuff was eaten away by the Milky Way, okay, ripped off by the gravitational pull of the Milky Way. Another exposure is done. Okay, here you see a three minute exposure of the Hercules cluster M13. Okay, and what the globular clusters might be, um, they might be the leftover cores of um, baby galaxies once orbiting our Milky Way. And other galaxies like the um, Andromeda galaxies 
also do have uh, globular clusters that you can spot using somewhat something like the Hubble telescope or something like that. And these are our baby dwarf eaten leftover galaxies <laughs> that orbit our Milky Way right now. And um, yeah, um, they have different appearance, but in general they look all somewhat the same <laughs> um, and some would argue they are not very interesting objects within the night sky but I really adore them uh, if you pull out the uh, pull if you pull the the the, um, the saturation in your images you can reveal the different star colors and this is quite a pretty thing to do with globular star clusters uh, that you image even though you could go with a higher focal length here so our field of view is a big big for this um, kind of object because we can't reveal um, the inner structure of uh, the globular cluster with 750 millimeter native focal length and my um, crop sensor okay um yeah Yuan is suggesting the uh, sickness region why not um gupaz uh, could you show c20 I would need to uh, look that up because I don't know what this is. You can get good results also in one hour under dark skies. Yeah, so E1 refers to um, to um, the fact that uh, under dark skies you can you have a much higher signal to noise ratio. So there will be more signal real if you compare it with the background noise. So all in all you have a darker background and thus a higher contrast within the image and you can get away with a much uh, lower exposure time overall integrated exposure time somewhere like that okay that's true okay but under my guys five hours are needed for any pretty pictures of andromeda galaxy um, and Ewan asked me whether i can zoom in to that image i could surely do that uh, wait a second. <laughs> I I don't know how to zoom within. Uh, oh, gamma rotate brightness. No, I don't know. Um. Oh no no this is <laughs> definitely the wrong thing to do <laughs> okay yeah i can pull out the image later on and show it to you a bit zoomed in why not wait a second um captures that um where's the image over there okay can i import that w wait a second why not? Properties. Search. No, it's the wrong folder. That should be the same. Okay. Uh, what is this? is quite big. Okay. Way bigger than I anticipated. Uh, where are you? Over there. Hmm. It should be possible, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> it doesn't work. I don't know why. I can show you later. Okay. I 
trying to crop that image. Uh, the image is so large and it won't fit into my field of view of this program. Uh, I think I'm getting closer. Wait a second. Okay, I can show the image again, but uh, that won't reveal any new information here, so whatsoever. I can try it later on. Um, <laughs> no worries, you are no worries. Okay. Um, C20. Yuan, <laughs> you saved my day. Look at that. So <laughs> left double click just did the trick. Okay, here we can see that my mount is not perfectly um, tracking the night sky so that the stars are ever so slightly elongated. So I need to um, do uh, proper guiding to um, get to even higher exposure times. But three minutes seems to be the limit, the hard limit for us right now, but that works just fine for us. And uh, now we can see the um, inner details of M13. So we see that the Hercules cluster um, has a very dense inner region and then the density drops when you increase the radius. And all that stars that you see right now are bound gravitationally and will circle the uh, center of gravity or the center of mass within the globular cluster. Um, what about M27? Okay, I need, <laughs> you know what? I need to create a list. Okay, we wanted to see C20 and M27. That was my suggest suggestion that you uh, suggest the next target and Amuari wants to see the uh, dumbbell, dumbbell nebula, excuse me, <laughs> and um, um, Koopa wants to see C20. Um, I have no idea what C20 is, but let's have a look. If it's within our reach, It's the nebulosity region above the Sadra region, and I was never there. Okay, you know what? I will pick a star in an interesting area over there. Excuse me, you can't see anything. There we are. So, again, C20 is... We are right now, we are down here at the great star cluster in Hercules. And then we stroll over here and you can see the Milky Way rising upwards. And then over here are some nebulosity regions. This is the Sadra reason, uh, region. This is very cool. And we also see the cooling towers over here. This is a very interesting region of space and uh, or of the night sky. But I think we will choose this, no, this region over here to see some nebulosity, maybe. And SLU. I can't promise you that we will see any cool details of the nebula because bottle 5, 3 minute exposures, I don't know, let's try. Why not? Okay, the... Uh, the chat is going wild. Many stars in center. Could you maybe balance the color image to red? I guess it's because you're using a modded DSLR. Yes, um, I'm using a modded DSLR, so I'm catching a lot of red photons, and this is cool for me because then we see uh, more nebulosity and uh, yeah. Um, that American nebula, no North American nebula, yes. Ah, okay, so. It's dimmer. And you uh, want suggest that we go with a higher ISO for that. And I'm totally 
on board with that. We are going with the highest ISO we can get and first try a second, uh, sec uh, 30 second exposure. And excuse me, there we are. The uh, seconds are running and then we see whether we uh, hit our target or if we're off to the side, I don't know. Okay, <coughs> filter helps, yeah. Mm. I can't apply a filter right now because that would ruin my current running set, uh, setup. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's pretty noisy. <laughs> okay, but you can see some red stuff going on over there. Okay, let's see <laughs> what we can do about that. Here we try the bull, but i800 and three minute exposures of uh, iso 800 okay so you can see the stars right there and we can do a quick a quick um plate solving to see whether we are where we wanted to be. So I chose the the most contrast rich area of the North American nebula. Um, yeah, we are spot on. Um, and we t we can talk a bit about uh, nebula in general. So. Um, when the uniform uh, universe formed roughly 14 billion years ago um, there was nearly almost just um, hydrogen within the universe and so this is the most abundant gas and um, most of the clouds you see here are hydrogen or called H for the molecu molecule name and um, stars are formed um, out of those gas structures or gas clouds when they reach a um, certain density level and collapse under gravity and um, if the collapse is strong enough and the um, gas is pushed or squeezed together in a very um, dense manner then you will ignite fusion and the star will uh, be born, yeah. And then stars go through a life circle, <laughs> just as we do, and they are growing, and they're eating, and they're <laughs> losing stuff to the environment <laughs> like we do, and then they die, as we do. And um, those um gas regions we can see their um in this case um h alpha emission regions that means that the nebula is um so there are stars formed by this nebula that are shining very bright they are shining onto the nebula and um pumping energy into the nebula and the h atoms are lifted to a higher energy state and when they fall back they will re-emit light in a very specific wavelength. And this is the H alpha line and this is a reddish light so this is why we tend to modify our DSLRs to be more sensitive to red light. Okay and so the three minute exposure is over and we switch back to um, sharp cap excuse me to ATP and here we have a faint glow of our nebulosity visible in one three minute exposure so something like the North American nebula or other nebulas or the Sardra region or stuff like that those are not visible through a normal eyepiece because it's just way too dim so we're we're going to 
have a look at brighter objects um, <laughs> down this evening and those nebula stru structures right now they are very dim and not um, to be seen with the naked eye easily. So a three minute exposure like this will only reveal parts of the of the nebulosity and I will try an auto stretch um, with an ATP, the APT and that reveals some of the of the nebula structure but overall you can't see much more within a single exposure. Uh, this is just not possible. Okay, with highest ISO, yeah, that was just too noisy and I uh, settled onto a medium ISO and three minute exposure. Um, the longer exposure will give better results, but not, <laughs> not, not the thing we saw with the Instellarium. Um, yeah, looks nicer, <laughs> looks better, but it's not. It's not very it's super noisy, but you get an idea of the nebulosity. And then again, you would take exposure after exposure after exposure after exposure and stack all the exposure information together into one final image stretch that data um, process it process it excuse me and then you would have a final result and this is only one single exposure so but either way cool that we saw something i think um yeah this is why i modified my camera to see those faint nebula structures in um, my exposures that would be way lower if I wouldn't astromodify my camera. Astromodification means that um, in order to get a good white balance the um, manufacturer of those DSLR cameras normally put filters in place that blocks um, um, light that is redder than red, so infrared light and we want that light and the uh, camera sensors are capable of capturing that light <laughs> and um, so we just remove that filter and then the sensors can do their best and um, increase the um, H alpha sensitivity from I think like 10% to maybe 80% or 70% way better than before okay have to go outside to test a small telescope but we'll leave the video on trying to go back there yeah okay bye io1 and hi everyone else in the chat notification yeah i tweeted um an hour ago that we are alive right now and we have 10 people visiting this chat room right now and this is Pretty cool. Hi to everyone. Okay. You want to ask me uh, <laughs> wrong program here? Whether I can zoom into the um, spikes he was talking about a few minutes ago. So those are um, diffraction spikes from my Newtonian telescope, and this is because my secondary mirror has a, uh, uh, a small structure that holds the mirror in place in the middle of my telescope so it's like suspended and those structures cross structures they are visible within bright objects so whenever a object an object is very bright you see those diffraction spikes and I really love them and you know what within that single three minute exposure we are able to distinguish the star colors. So we can see here that stars do have very different colors. And, um, that's due to their age and their, their current stage um, they are, let's say, living in or their size. And um, for example, our sun is a white, yellow, colorish star and um, those blue stars tend to be very big and very hot maybe very young um, and the big and bright stars tend to live uh, way shorter than the um, smaller and more yellowish stars because they 
um, they just spill out all their energies at once and there are some giant stars only living like millions of years whereas our sun can live billions of years and a, a factor of a thousand that's quite interesting so and we can see the different star colors in, in this image and i really like that okay cool either way Thanks, Kupertes, for the compliment. Um, uh, Nico's Nico's channel is superb. Yeah, that's he's a, a great guy, doing really cool stuff. Um, yeah, Yuan, I could do that, but um, I have difficulties connecting my DSLR camera to uh, SharpCap. I will try that uh, within the next live stream, but. For now, I think we will leave that region of the night sky, head over to Stellarium, and we are going to find us the little dumbbell nebula right there. There's our telescope. So this is what the dumbbell nebula should look like and we're going to initiate a okay a 3 minute exposure of the dumbbell nebula and meanwhile I can talk a bit about that specific target now it's pretty big in the in the screen Okay, um, so this is a remnant of a dead star. So right in the middle you can see a bright point, and this is a star, a star that went supernova some time ago. Um, I can search the name. No, I can't find the name. Um, yeah, it's called a planetary nebula. So this is a nebulosity um, surrounding a white dwarf, a white dwarf star. Um, and uh, that means that um, the star burns through its normal uh, phase of life. And in the end, the stars uh, can choose different paths of <laughs> of death <laughs> depending on their you know, on their weight and um, some stars uh, go supernova that means that they explode in a giant um, explosion in space and throw out the outer layers of their atmosphere into the space into the universe and only a dim small core remains normally so this is one possible path for the ending of a star like just cooling out would be another path i think that our sun might be within this faith so just blowing to a red star and then just cooling shrinking and cooling again but this star uh, decided to go all out and shove all the outer atmospheric layers into space and uh, leave only a small corpus behind and the gas that is now uh, floating through space with a shock wave that creates this um, energy rich region uh, that you see on top and on the bottom uh, where gas is compressed um, normally by interstellar um, gas medium and uh, then heated up and um, radiates away the um, different wavelength and thus we can see the shock front of that expanding gas bubble um, from that explosion and our exposure is nearly done so I will switch over to APT and it's way too bright because I forgot to clean the 
auto stretch and there we are so this is the dumbbell nebula with an apt um, a three minute exposure of that region and you can compare the image within Stellarium oriented like that and the image we took just right now. So you see there in the middle is the um, the white dwarf, the remnant star and then you see the shock front propagating up and down in all directions, also in our direction. Um, there seems to be a slight unsymmetry because you can't see that shock front on the left and on the right hand side and I personally have no clue why this should be the case other than something like uh, spin momentum or something like that so if you have any idea why this might be the case um, please please post that in the uh, live chat below because I would be highly interested in that I don't know. Um, Gupa has asked me whether the Orion Nebula is high enough for imaging at my location. I think so. Yeah, later in the evening. Um, and the Pleiades will be uh, will be visible soon because right now I think they are behind a tree. <laughs> but either way, I. I will give it a try in a few minutes. So, while looking at the Dumbbell Nebula, I um, I highly encourage everyone in the chat to suggest some new targets that we can visit this night and give them a short step visit. Not to produce a stunning and perfect image, but just to produce a preview of what the images might look like all the objects in the night sky. Cool, cool. So far we had um, an open star cluster, a globular star cluster, we had a um, region in the night sky where nebulosity is visible, the North American nebula, and now we have a planetary nebula, a rather big one, and maybe we can find us a bright small one and um, we can look at another galaxy because the Andromeda galaxy, as we saw, uh, did not fit uh, into one field of view. And that was very unfortunate. And we can compensate for that by just, uh, by just visiting another uh, galaxy. Amari points out uh, that the Ring Nebula isn't far away either. You know what? I think you are right. And this would be a sweet little thing to visit as well. Is that the Ring Nebula? Wait a second. I can always forget to change to Solarium. So we are, uh, we are right now here. This is the Dumbbell Nebula over here. And... Um, Right there is the Ring Nebula. The Ring Nebula is also a planetary nebula. Ring Nebula. Messier 57 is also a planetary nebula in the Mali Northern constellation of Lyra. And you know, why not? So, I asked Stellarium to slew over to this object, and there's our telescope. And this time we're going to shoot a short test exposure of uh, 10 seconds or something like that, just to be sure that we're still pointing on the, on the right spot in the night sky. And also, whoa, look at that. Look at that. And also, the Ring Nebula is quite bright. But the Ring Nebula is quite small, if you compare it with the last image. 
Free Zone. But there it is. There it is. There's the Ring Nebula. And we still point like straight on. And I will create a three minute exposure with with my telescope and that will be probably that will be too much for this object because this object is very very bright so you can see the um, ring nebula without any troubles using a, a, an eyepiece and your telescope I think what do you say in the chat like six inch and above or can you see the ring nebula with a four inch telescope I don't know I don't I don't own a, f a smaller telescope than six inch uh, yeah Gupa Guptas um, points out that the ring nebula is actually quite small for my setup but lucky us Ewan from Galaxy Art, Me Art Media um, told me how to zoom <laughs> with an <laughs> APT and so we can see it either way Okay, we have 60 seconds um, out of 180 second exposure time. Um, and I can talk a bit about the Ring Nebula was discovered by the French astronomer Charles Messier in 1779. Uh, and um, he was on the mission of discovering the comet Bode on this time. Um, okay, I tried to find an information whether it's possible to see that object with a smaller telescope. Okay, it's best observed using a telescope with an aperture of at least 20 centimeters or 8 inch. Okay. But even 3 inch will reveal the elliptical ring shape. Okay, so the interior hole can be resolved by 4 inch. Okay, there you have it. You need 4 inch at least to um, see that uh, nebula. Or the, the inner structure of the nebula. Now we have 6 inch and that's obviously uh, enough for us <laughs> to to reveal not only the shape but maybe you can maybe you can see the the uh, inner star I don't know no it's not really uh, maybe so as the dumbbell nebula this um, this planetary nebula of course has a center uh, star um, that is a remnant corpse of the star that exploded and what we see here is the outer shell expanding into the interstellar medium which is not a perfect vacuum and there goes our exposure and there it is and now you can not only see the colors of that um, object the reddish and uh, uh, green bluish parts um, that are different wavelength um, of that light but you can see the center star and this is pretty cool i can't zoom in higher so this is all the surrounding with the bright stars uh, and the diffraction spikes and this is the ring nebula with its oval shape and the center star and that looks very very cool i think it's cool <laughs> okay, Aryan came back with an easier name for me. <laughs> Hi there. Um, yeah, and there we see the nebula stru structure. Um, the is, is a class of such stubborn nebula mass and bipolar. So um, as the um, the dumbbell nebula as well the. Um, the uh, ring nebula seems to have a um, bipolar um, structure. Um, and this is just a very, very cool image. For one single exposure time, I'm very, very happy with that. 
with the appearance. And we can stroll through that image and see different different star colors here, redder stars, bluer stars. And over there, and that object in the middle. We won't take another exposure because there's not much more to reveal for us within that um, quite quite um, limited time range. What we can do though is we can use this half of the night sky wait a second there's stellarium we can use this half of the sky to um, view another nebula over here i think it's called the crescent nebula crescent nebula i don't know how to pronounce it and it's uh, quite cool and a, a short three minute exposure will do we, we won't get an image somewhat like that but um, this is such a cool shockwave front or um, I will tell APT to capture us an image crescent nebula yeah, it's an emission nebula. Um, we are in the constellation of Cygnus. We are um, roughly 3,000 light years away. Uh, 5,000 light years away, excuse me. It was discovered by Herschel, uh, 1792. And uh, this is a nebula front not um, produced by a dying star, but by a very, by a very, very um, hot and uh, emitting stars so the the hot stars the bright stars they emit a lot of particles called solar wind and if those solar winds um, hit interstellar medium it can um, energize that gas region and so the wolf right star wr136 um, uh, its solar wind is colliding with the interstellar medium and is producing that rather impressive looking um, nebula right here. And uh, APT is around half of its uh, three minutes and will produce us some faint hints of that nebulosity, I think. Ariane, you can uh, enter in Lower Saxony, that will do it. So, I live in Lower Saxony in Germany, and that is precise enough to get a somewhat fair idea of what I'm looking at right now. Hi Tom! Yo, so many cloudy nights here. That's true for me as well, so cloudy nights all the time. I don't know what happens to us here. Okay, and we are nearly ready. I'm switching over, so don't. Th we are not at the uh, ring nebula anymore, but at the crescent nebula, a emission nebula, and uh, there are the last seconds of our three-minute exposure time, and then we might see some faint hints of that nebulosity. I just thought, if we're in the... Oh uh, man, <laughs> it's not very impressive, <laughs> is it? <laughs> okay, I just thought, if we're in the same region of the night sky, we might just try for that. Okay, let me see. Um, so right now, right here in the middle is, is the Crescent Nebula, and I do an auto-stretch very roughly, and... Uh, 
yeah <laughs> that's what we are seeing right now so it's not very impressive but it's there and it's cool and i thought why not okay so and you have the bright star in the middle right there and its emission its uh, stellar wind collides with the outer outer space um, interstellar medium this faint ultra faint gas that's floating between the stars and if the if the solar wind smacks into that gas it's getting energized and it radiates away that energy within very very specific wavelength and these wavelengths are then collected by our camera not by our eye you can't see that with a naked eye Edward, um, in the chat, I tried to image the Crescent Nebula a few weeks ago, but I failed to make good flats. Yeah, so he's talking about um, calibration frames. And calibration frames are quite important in astrophotography, and we have different um, calibration frames that we can use. Um, there are um, the dark frames that tries to capture everything that's going on inside the camera when in the absence of light hitting the sensor. So you try to enclose the camera and then take images in total darkness and everything that's happening then is just like noise from the camera and stuff like that and you remove that afterwards in post-processing. And uh, he tried to do uh, flats, that means that you try to image a bright and um, evenly lit surface with the same focus and camera orientation settings and uh, aim to uh, remove sorts like vignetting so the uh, darker outer regions you see in my image here there is the the core that's more bright and the outer regions are more dark so this is vignetting there's not the same amount of light hitting the sensor um, comparing the inner parts and the outer parts of the image. And so you take flats to compensate for that. And then you can take bias frames and stuff like that. So it's, it's a rather complex process from a single three minute exposure like this to a final result that looks like the things you see within Stellarium or on Twitter or anywhere else. Rob is here. Hi, Chris. Yeah, hi, Rob. <laughs> I'm I'm honored to have you here on my live stream. Cool. Yeah, Rob is um, very active on Twitter, and we met over there, and uh, he was so kind to join us here, and he retreated my uh, my outreach for all you folks to join me here on this evening, and I'm very glad that. Uh, 16, 16 people are watching right now with me through my telescope and that's just a very cool thing to do. I really like those live sessions a lot. Okay, you know what, um, we won't see any more details from the Crescent Nebula with a 3 minute exposure so we say, okay, goodbye to this region of the night sky. Uh, there's Stellarium, so we were over there. And now I think it's time to stroll back. Oh, there's Jupiter. You know what? We're gonna image, we're gonna image a planet, because why not? I mean, it's a DSO session, but just a little glimpse, so. <laughs> I think this is, it's legal, isn't it? Just because we are in the same region in the night sky, and why not? And um, Jupiter is so cool. So, to be clear, uh, my setting is not a planetary setting. So what we are doing right now is like freestyling, okay? So we are using a DSLR um, and no Barlow and stuff just to image a planet, and this is not feasible. You shouldn't do that. You know, so planetary imaging and DSO imaging, those are two totally different things to do. But come on, 
Yeah, okay. We will turn on the live the live view of the camera to reveal Jupiter. Wait a second. There we are. So this is a live view of Jupiter. And maybe I can zoom in. No. APT always crashes when I do that. But you know what? What I can do is I can do a like very, 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 very short exposure. Whee! And this is Jupiter. <laughs> okay, that might, that might be too short. Okay, let me try something like that. Okay, it's too it's too long for Jupiter because we can't see any surface details. But now we can see the moons. Look at that. We see the the moons of Jupiter right there. Isn't it beautiful? Okay, and Bu Jupiter in the middle is way overexposed, so don't look at that. But uh, we can see the moons, and that's pretty cool. And then we can shrink down the exposure time to a minimum, and maybe able to view some surface details. Though we are not okay. <laughs> Maybe with a lower ISO. <laughs> now Jupiter's just gone. <laughs> what are we doing here? 800 is too... too short. We, we can't do that, okay? You need a planetary camera to, to do this planet justice. And, okay, it was just a joke. Okay, M... 81 um, M81 Bodus Galaxy and Kakuox Ex Excuse me if I mispronounce your names but it's um, Good evening everyone have you every, uh, already seen Galaxies tonight? Okay, so um, I say Okay, now we have a list Um, we want to image M81 galaxies of my choosing, which galaxies, which I think we might visit the Triangulum Galaxy and the Whirlpool, so. and the Double Cluster. Okay. That sounds like a fair deal to me. Okay. And the player Ds are on their way. So I say we choose the Triangulum Galaxy, because why not, because, just because we can. Then we have a galaxy to look at. Okay. So as I said, my telescope needs to spin around like 180 degrees, because we are now in the in a different part of the night sky. And um, then we need to do some short exposures to refine our position in the night sky. Yeah, Wolfsburg is roughly in the same area. You can enter that. I mean, <laughs> for a first guessing, even Berlin would do it, but... <laughs> Choose Wolfsburg or something else, Hamburg or stuff. Okay, there we are. And then we need to take a short sub-exposure to determine our place in the night sky. And off we go. Just to uh, reposition our telescope, because for sure the telescope has not achieved that high amount of precision 
and thus we're a bit off and thereby Ooh, what is that uh, clear but we have plate solving for exactly those okay the triangle triangulum galaxy is a very dim galaxy but we will try whether a three minute exposure will do any good okay so we are off but not by a big margin so i'm proud of my mount after slowly like 180 degrees that's cool and please give me a 30 second exposure as iso 3000 because we can and while we wait for apt to do its job right here and see our second galaxy this evening I will enter the Okay, we see nothing. So all we can see right now is the faint core of um, M33 in the middle because the um, aerial luminosity of M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, is very, 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 very low. Excuse me. Over there. And so now I ask APT to create a three minute exposure to reveal a bit more detail of this galaxy for our eyes. And then we might find some brighter galaxy. But unfortunately the Boat's galaxy and the Whirlpool galaxy are not within our reach tonight. They're both behind my my um, rooftop. But we have a few star clusters creeping across my roof. And we have the Pleiades still to go. Um, these are very bright objects and we can see them easily and uh, we can um, we can image a um, a dwarf planet Ceres is a big asteroid on the edge of being a planet uh, no it's a big spherical asteroid and we can image that as well even though it will only be a faint dot in the night sky but it's still an asteroid and I think that counts as being cool. Okay, so I need to update my chat. Hi to everyone. Um, if you're joining this chat right now, we are doing a um, deep space a live astrophotography session. So we are jumping from target to target within the night sky and you can um, make suggestions in the chat below and um, wish for some new targets. And um, right now we are trying to get a first glimpse on the um, Triangulum Galaxy M33. That is a face-on galaxy. That means that we don't see it from the edge, but we see it like face-on. And now we have a three-minute exposures with ISO 3200. And that's a bit too much, but using auto-stretch, we can barely see <laughs> some some of the uh, structures of the arms in the middle so no 
something like that. So you see the, the bright core in the middle and then you see spiral arms spiraling out. But you need a lot more darter. Um, from my location with my light pollution and using my telescope with my um, modern DSLR to see anything um, from that galaxy at all. So three minutes are unfortunately not enough for us to see um, some results here. But you can see, you can barely make out some um, spiral details. But the Andromeda galaxy was way more imp impressive, no doubt. So we we won't stay on this target forever m33 so the triangle galaxy m33 is the third largest member of our local group. So our local group means that we um, we have galaxies containing billions of stars and those galaxies uh, group together um, being pulled together by gravity. And um, our group, that where the, the Milky Way is uh, one galaxy of this group, is called the local group and contains the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy and uh, the Triangulum Galaxy, which is the third largest member um, after the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way. And is one of the most distant permanent objects that can be viewed with the naked eye. This is interesting. I was never able to see the Triangulum Galaxy with my naked eye. Um, even even in Stellarium. Even in Stellarium, it's very dim. So you see the bright center core over there. And um, in our test exposure, we were able to, to see some structures of the, of the arms and not much more. And I can't think that you're able to see much more than the um, core region of this galaxy. Uh, five. <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm shooting from um, bottle five to bottle six. Depends on weather and light pollution and stuff like that. Okay, so this is our Im image of that. So next target, next stop will be will be the Pleiades. Current object, slew, center, scroll. There we are. The Pleiades will be our next target. This is an open star cluster as well. You can still see some of the gas clouds, um, the cluster formed within. And we're gonna take a short exposure to get a grip at where we are on the night sky right now. A 10 second short sub exposure just to make sure that we are in the right position in the night sky. And that framing and stuff is okay and there you see it and then I use Astro Detour to plate solve that particular image and here you have the the short sub exposure of 10 seconds you see the stars and the plate solving is done and we re to the target and then we ask for a much longer exposure. And meanwhile we return to Stellarium. So Uh, 
Um, the Pleiades are called the uh, Seven Sisters because you can barely make out seven individual stars using the naked eye. And it's an open star cluster because it's not spherical as we saw with M13. So it's part of our Milky Way, it's within our Milky Way. The distance is... Blah, let me Google that. Distance, distance. Nearest to Earth, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so somewhat like a few hundred light years away. And um, why doesn't it tell the distance? I really want to know the distance right now. Um, 444 light years. So a few hundred light years was correct. And um, so with an hour Milky Way and you still see the remnant gas of the stars that formed within this cluster. And it's truly the most obvious star cluster you can see <laughs> with your naked eye. It's, it's a very uh, uh, iconic view. So and uh, the cluster contains hot blue stars and hot blue stars are very big and hot blue stars don't live long because they waste all their energy at an instant. And I think APT is just in its final capturing phase. 140 seconds of 180 seconds and while APT gets its final seconds, I can scroll over the chat room and Rob points out 444 light years and this is correct. Yeah, um, Ariane, Ariane wishes to be in the southern hemisphere to um, see core of the Milky Way and stuff like that, yeah. But we're trapped here in the in the northern part. So okay, here's the data coming in from our camera, and this is the um, region around the Pleiades. And can I try an auto stretch? No, that looks awful. Okay, we won't do that. So with one single three minute exposures, I'm not really able to pull out any more details, but we see the very pretty reflection, uh, reflection spikes from my Newtonian telescope and the uh, imperfect tracking because I'm unguided right now. And we see some hints of the nebulosity around this star and some hints about around this star um, but all in all hello philip um Yeah, we can't see any more details with a single three minute exposure with my DSLR. So, but these are the stars, these are the seven sisters. And, um, okay, let's, let's have a look in the chat. Philip joined us from Cloudy Switch. Ariane, can you try to see these? Heart Nebula and the Iris Nebula. Yeah, we we can try that. I don't know whether the heart nebula fits into my field of view, but we can give it a go later on. We wanted to um, image some open clusters before that. And there's Widu from Astroforum. Cool, Chris, is this live? Yeah, Widu, this is live. So this is me using my 
um, telescope, my Newtonian telescope, 750 millimeter focal length, um, 6 inch and um, attached with a DSLR, a Canon EOS 700D Astro modified using a modest light pollution filter from my <coughs> Bortle 5 to 6 um, sky shooting RGB color. So it's a bit tricky to reveal um, nebulosity parts of um, objects in the night sky, but hey, uh, it's a cool journey up until now. And um, yeah, we want to see whether we are able to fetch some cool clusters. We had visited the spiral cluster earlier this night and we can just swiftly go to the starfish cluster is a nice cluster or the pinwheel cluster is a nice cluster as well you know what i don't care we will slew over to the starfield uh, starfish cluster um, and ask APT to give us somewhat like a 10 seconds sub exposure to check whether we are in the right part of the night sky. Would be unfortunate if my mount. Um, Beetlejuice. Uh, Sex Galaxia asked me, hi, can we have a look at Beetlejuice? Okay, okay, no, we, I need to update my list, okay. M81 um, is not in the field of view right now, Whirlpool is behind my roof, Triangulum was too faint, we're opting for the double cluster later on, Beetlejuice is within the chat, so if you have any suggestions, please leave a comment down below. I 1800 okay wait a second data was coming in and we saw that we are right in frame and so i ask apt to shoot us our three minute exposure and in the meantime okay iris nebula c4 i can't promise anything okay because i don't know whether these objects are within our field of view or not m16 was asked by wv astrophotography okay so first of all was the double cluster and i can yeah oh, 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 the double cluster is our definitely our next target because double cluster is very very beautiful But right now, we let APT do its job of collecting photons, or as I would say, because it's the channel's name, catching photons. <laughs> this is what we do in astrophotography. Cool, cool, cool. Um, M15 may still be a visible night, nice globular cluster, um, says we do from Astroforum. And we might do that as well after the double cluster. Why not? So I don't think I need to introduce Widow from Astroforum, but I do. Um, he uh, has a <laughs> very, very, very great channel on YouTube and he has done so many so helpful videos and I can say I literally learned walking the field of astrophotography with uh, his videos under my feet to stand on. So we do thank you very much for supporting us all with your great content. It's it's uh, every video of you is highly appreciated and um, I did a um, collaboration video with a few astrophotographers on YouTube and I uh, reached out to everyone and Widu was like the first to react and uh, very very helpful and a friendly guy so definitely make sure to check out his channel. Cool thing. 
Yeah, Galaxy Art Media, another channel I can recommend. This is Iwan from Galaxy Art Media um, and he has cool videos about uh, his astrophotography journal as a journey as well and uh, we uh, are still in our um, processes of um, trying to come up with a collabor collaborative uh, live stream that would be a cool thing but I'm very honored to have Iwan here on my chat joining us this night and there is data flowing in I hear the clicking of my DSLR and there is the cluster cool so this is a a very um, typical appearance of a open star cluster and you can see uh, a very loose formation so the stars are might be still bound by gravity mm, but are drifting apart from each other and uh, spreading over the um, disk of the um, of the Milky Way slowly being ripped apart by the gravitational forces of the Milky Way and uh, neighboring star clusters and denser parts of the arms of the the spiral arms of the Milky Way and slowly losing their um, their um, appearance so next in line was the double cluster this is an open cluster as well and it's not far from not far from our from our position right now we are down here where eq6r pro is written and so we are slowing up towards the zenith with also means that we are dealing with less light pollution so you see my mount moving upwards right now reaching for this point and then we can center this object Maybe we move over to this point, something like that, and ask APT to give us something like 30 second exposure to reveal some, some parts of this open cluster. So this is a double cluster, a very beautiful one uh, with very beautiful star colors and um, we try there's a red star at the bottom says Philip yeah this is possible so stars do have different different colors um, because of different metallicity um, or different different phases of their life so okay so we're we're off <laughs> I need to recenter my mount. Show you here. This is what I got. Nothing. And then I take the last image, this image, and re sync the mount. And let the um, plate solving do its job. And then we can see on screen where we are. Okay, we we haven't been off by a big margin. We just need a longer exposure, it seems. Or oh, or shoot. because I really want to get a good grip on that 
beautiful star cluster. Okay, I need to update the chat because from time to time the chat does not work as intended. Yeah, um, Iwan points out that there might be some more mu light pollution. Uh, this is possible, yeah. Um, whenever we get close to the horizon, there's a lot more light pollution over there. So now we see You know what? I expected a bit more <laughs> of that cluster. Are we in the right spot of the night? You know, of the night sky? It, it looks off to me. Oh, I played solved it two, two times. No, we are not in the right spot. Definitely not. I'm, I'm playing, I'm solving again. Because I think we are off. I think something went wrong. We should at least see some open star cluster. Current object, slew. Okay, I need to take another text ex uh, test exposure because I think something went wrong here. And the telescope lost track of where it is right now and we need to resync the actual position of the telescope. So this is this is the spot in the night sky we are looking at. And now we are telling my program in the background to sync up with that, to uh, search for the star patterns, extract the sources, the stars, uh, solve them, and then tell the telescope where it might be pointing at. And my telescope is not responding. So this... I disconnect and connect with the telescope. Then I choose my target and I slew again. And the telescope is not responding. You know what? I don't get it. We gonna try another star. So this might happen with an astrophotography. Um, it's just possible that because it's a very complex thing to do with all the software and settings and stuff that uh, sometimes things just won't work as expected. And now I'm in the process of resyncing my telescope with the actual current position. I was looking to a, a different location within the night sky. And sort of got where I needed to. I don't know. This is a bit annoying. Maybe, maybe we search for. for something bright again that I can easily, 
easily, easily. Um, see as such. Okay. Uh, let's try Mr. Beetlejuice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, I copied that onto my uh, holy. What shall we? What shall we image list? But first, of, it's, it's it's second in list. First, we want to finish the. Okay, this worked just fine. I don't know. So. Well, the double cluster just. Beetlejuice is not not on the on the horizon yet, so it's still beneath the horizon. We can have a look at another bright star, like Aldebaran. Aldebaran, excuse me. Just if you want to have a look at a very bright star. If everything works. <laughs> Something like that. There you can clearly see um, the amount of color that a star can have. So, And you can see the uh, diffraction spikes that my lovely Newtonian telescope can produce. So I excuse for the mishap uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I don't know. The calibration between the telescope and my software was uh, somewhat confused or I was confused. I don't know. But now everything seems to work just fine. I don't know. Well, that cluster was just very, very faint. Um, I couldn't see a thing and I thought we were off and maybe it was my mistake. I don't know. Yeah, okay. But here's Here's another star. Here is um, the star Aldebaran. So, and while we are here, we can have a look at uh, Ceres. This is an asteroid with an orbit. The, the image I'm showing right now is a star, and um, well, it's 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 a bit pretty, but it's a bit lame. So we normally in astrophotography we don't image uh, single stars because they're just stars, so we we tend to image star constellations like clusters or galaxies or nebula or stuff like that, or cool stuff like that. Wait, maybe we can see that. Maybe with a fifteen second exposure time, I can slew over to um, Ceres. That's a asteroid, an asteroid within the asteroid belt, spherical though. And APT, please give us a short exposure of, say, 15 seconds. And that might reveal the asteroid. And I did a, a video about how to, how to identify asteroids and to calculate their orbit using nothing but your data from your backyard. And that was a lot of fun. So. I did a little bit of math, which is cool. It's just school math, nothing, nothing fancy, and it's not very accurate. Accurate, but you can like estimate the uh, orbit and put it somewhere between. I don't know. I think it was like a tenth AU or something like that. So we're gonna plate solve that latest image to see whether we are dead on because we want to identify Sirius as what it is. Right now we see a lot of bright points and I think the point right in the middle that might be Sirius. But I'm not quite sure. And now I'm asking my telescope to reslew so that um, Sirius is right in the middle and that worked, so we take another exposure and then we will find our little asteroid, which is very cool, I think. Yeah, 
there it is. You can see right in the middle, um, the wrong window, that point here, this little man, <laughs> this little dot over there, this is actually an asteroid. And if we waited a few minutes, which we can do that, um, then we will see movement within that asteroid. So it's moving across the night sky relative to the background stars um, because it has a an orbit around the sun and the background stars called fixed stars. They are not entirely fixed but um, for our time spans of minutes they are quite fixed. Okay and after that there was the question of going to M15. Just having a look of M15. We're waiting a few minutes right now. M15 is the Pegasus cluster. Would be cool as well. Why not? And I don't know whether the Iris Nebula is visible right now having a look but seriously the iris nebula is so faint we won't see anything i promise you that so i think we will spare that m16 is not visible from my location unfortunately and then last thing on the list was this one here the heart nebula yeah, we can try that, even though I don't think we will be successful with that. But why not? We can give it a try. So the next target will be the Heart Nebula. After we waited a few minutes, because I really want to take another image of Sirius. Sirius? Sirius, the asteroid. And see whether uh, it moved or not. That would be cool. To, to reveal that motion to show you folks that the that the solar system is actually you saw that <laughs> don't tell me that this is not cool okay <laughs> this is so awesome okay you just saw the, mo the the movement of our solar system from here to there from here to there. I love that. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. We're gonna slew over um, to the Heart Nebula, which is a very famous and very, very pretty nebula, even though I have to admit, I don't think that we're gonna see much um, with single exposures. But we don't know, so. It's late in the night, and we just try stuff. Um, okay, um, for that we need to confirm whether we are on track or not, because I will spend three minutes on the exposure and I don't want to waste it. And then I can go over Crab Nebula. Sag's galaxy is all into Crab Nebula. Why not? So Betelgeuse double cluster was erased. We replace it with Crab Nebula. Then we look at APT, whether we are on track. We plate solve the whole image and see whether the PC tells us that we are on track. That's important. Um, so the plate solving will extract um, stars, compare it to known patterns, and then solve that and um, give that to my this information to my mount, and we will use a lower ISO 800 and go. But don't expect much of that experiment because. It's a very faint object. I, 
I'll show you here in Stellarium, this is the hot nebula. Um, my field of view does not match this um, target. And this is an important uh, thing to consider. So um, when planning your first telescope or another telescope, the field of view or the focal length, um, so the magnification, if you will, of your telescope should be one of the main concerns because the focal length highly um, dictates what you can do with your telescope and what you can't do with your telescope. So I have something like an intermedium telescope with 750 millimeter focal length. It's long enough for some of the smaller targets to resolve them and it's short enough for some of the bigger targets but it's too long for some of the really big targets. For example the Hart Nebula is just too big and it's too short for some of the really small targets. So I really need to increase my focal length by let's say factor of three or something like that with a Barlow lens to uh, capture planets or small galaxies that are really really tiny and there a telescope with a long native focal length would be great and I would need to use a focal reducer of 0.75 or 0 0.5 um, so to enlarge my field of view and capture some of the um, larger stuff um, out there in the night sky. Um, I can do a little bit of research about the nebula. The hard nebula. Look at that. It's some 7500 light years away from Earth and is located in the Perseus arm of our galaxy in the constellation of Cassiopeia, discovered by William Herschel. It's an emission nebula. It's, this, it's very reddish. You see that here in Stellarium. That again means that the gas gets energized and then falls back from its energy level. And um, we can see it. Um, Galaxy Art Media. Ioan, was a pleasure to watch your live video. Will do uh, make some short video of Jupiter with a small 60 mark. Chat more on Instagram later. Yeah, please guys. Ioan, thanks. Um, thanks for joining us here and I'm really looking forward to um, uh, hosting a live stream in cooperation with you and um, everyone who has not visited Ioan's uh, channel go to Galaxy Art Media on YouTube and check out his fantastic videos. He uses a max of telescopes to uh, capture planets and stuff like that. And we have data coming in, I believe. and. I believe you see something like nothing, or not much at least. Um, I can try to reveal some of the of the auto stretch. No. Okay. So for you to get an understanding of what's going on here, uh, we try to image the heart nebula, but with um, my camera setting and the current light pollution and without a narrowband filter it's nearly not possible to get any good available data within a single frame. So we took three minute exposure and we get nearly nothing. So I can stretch that data a little bit and we still can't see anything, not even a single trace. That means if you want to image um, targets like that, that are purely emission nebula and they are very faint. Um, that means that you need to uh, use narrowband filters. So you just pick out that specific wavelength of your target and just image that. And then you can like do 10 minute exposures without overexposing your, your image and um, capture only that data and get a much higher contrast or a signal to noise um, than using and DSLR, modified DSLR that I do. Um, Arian asked me, how long is each of your live streams? You know, something like that. So two hours, three hours max. So my, my live streams up until now were like two hours and then we came to a rest. But I want to image some more stuff in the 
Nice guy. Yeah, there it is. We want to visit another nebula. And it's the Crab Nebula. And after that, we're going to see whether Beetlejuice <laughs> gets out of his shoes. Okay. Um, where's that? Okay, so we are now... Um, you know back in this region of the night sky the Pleiades are above us we had the um, pinwheel cluster where we <laughs> didn't see anything we uh, visited Aldebaran and now we are at the crab nebula I'm gonna center it so that you see what we might expect so the crab nebula is quite um, quite small So, we first try a short sub-exposure. Um, it's quite small, um, but on the other hand, it's not so dark. So, if we expose like three minutes, we should see a fair amount of, of details. So, let's have a look. We're spot on. Okay, that fuzzy blobby blob 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 in the middle is... Uh, is all we can see. And then we image 30 seconds at ISO 800 to get a proper look at the object. And then we're gonna image a three minute exposure. I think that's fair. And still the Orion constellation, which we all hope to see is still beyond my roof unfortunately okay uh, we haven't gained much so we'll try a full three minute exposure and in the meantime auto stretch that so this faint blob in the middle is what we are looking for this is the crab nebula um, and again, this is Crab Nebula. It's again a supernova remnant um, in the constellation of Taurus. Yeah, it's I don't know whether, why it's called the Crab Nebula, but um, again, there was a star at the end of its life. And it exploded and pushed all that matter into the universe and the outwards reaching gas gets heated up and then emits light in certain wavelength. And um, this is, by the way, uh, how we are all made. So there's a saying we are all made out of uh, stardust and that's true. So um, as I said, when the universe formed, there was only hydrogen and um, then um, stars formed and the stars are like breeding the heavier elements and uh, under the pressure and the temperatures and fusion stuff and complicated, I don't know. But uh, they're breeding the heavier elements and uh, collecting them and if they explode they they spill that uh, heavier elements out into the universe where it can condense us down into those gas clouds and recollapse and form heavier stuff yeah like oxygen or um, like carbon yeah or iron stuff like that okay that we are made out of um, because when the universe formed there was no oxygen or carbon or stuff like that there was formed within stars and this is something i'm always amazed by if i think about that and then second thing is um we thought that silver and gold and stuff is also bred inside stars and this is partially true i think so supernovas can i think produce that as well but um scientists found that um, the amount of silver and gold is too high and that there was another explanation needed for 
those elements to occur in the universe. And these are neutron stars, so these are stars nearly going into a black hole phase, but not quite. And if they collate and rip apart, they form heavier metals, like silver and gold. So, And you're wearing, wearing uh, jewelry, you should consider that. Oh, it's super bright. I can't see. Whoop. I need to do a color correction, excuse me. Because the, the background is way too bright and so you can't see any details of the, of the uh, object itself. Uh, Ariane asks, can you image the California nebula? I think it will be too faint for a single exposure like this. Now let me have a look at that data of the Crab Nebula first. RGB. RGB. Okay. I can do like a quick process of the data, but it's, it's not very much to see. Again, you'd need like way more exposure time to get this, to do this any justice. And maybe I can show to you. I don't know whether this works or not. I, I don't know. There it is. Okay. So this is the image we took a few minutes ago. If I run it through a basic auto stretch. And this blobby blob in the middle is this remnant of the supernova explosion. And if you spend like an hour on this target, you will see like uh, structurally filaments within the middle and stuff like that. Okay, folks. I think we are returning to our first target of the night, the Andromeda Galaxy, just so that you have the chance to see a proper galaxy in case you're just so entering this right now. Um, and after that, Rob says in the chat, William Parsons sketched M1 one time and thought it looked like a crap. He tried again later and it didn't look like a crap, but the name stuck regardless. So that's a pity. Wow. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the information, Rob. Um, you might see in Stellarium that uh, something is not working with the synchronization of my mount in uh, Stellarium. So the, the Stellarium tells me that my mount is off. But uh, as you will see right now, we are dead on. And I can't tell you what's, what's happening right now. I don't know, really. But it shall not uh, bother us too much. So, again, this is a 10 second exposure of the Andromeda Galaxy, the big 
neighbor, sister, twin sister galaxy. And um, this is somewhat what we, what we might expect seeing the Andromeda galaxy through a smaller telescope. So you can see the Andromeda galaxy with a naked eye. You can image it with uh, your smartphone. I did that. It's a cool thing to do. And now we are getting a 30 second exposure, but with a lower ISO, so we are losing information. Um, so we boosting up the ISO. Um, and that's that. So visual astronomy for deep sky visual astronomy is most likely, I mean, you can't find the targets and you can't see them but they're always very dim because deep sky astro targets are just always very, very dim. Um, it's uh, tricky to find them without plate solving and um, don't expect a whole lot to see, okay? So you will see a fuzzy blob in the middle and maybe two or three fuzzy blobs around that and that's all. And And that's okay. And that's okay because on the other hand, you just saw photons from a distant object, um, from a distant object um, millions of light years away. Not millions of kilometers, but millions of light years. And those photons, they traveled a nearly straight line from their origin, from the Milky Way, from some stars to your eye and hit your very eye right in that moment. And I always find it very fascinating to look through an eyepiece and see those very, very, very distant objects with my own eyes. But on the other hand, you don't get any fancy uh, Instagram-like images just by looking through an eyepiece. But you get the real experience if you can frame it like that, and that's something cool as well. So uh, this is the Andromeda galaxy. It's our naval galaxy uh, right there in the middle, and you can see the, the dust lanes of the arms uh, rotating around the bright central core, and uh, in the lower section you can see a small baby satellite galaxy of M31, the Andromeda galaxy, and in the upper right corner you can see a faint flossy floss, and that's another satellite galaxy of M31, the Andromeda galaxy, because the Andromeda galaxy is just very, very big. Doral says, thank you for the live stream, you're awesome, thank you for participating within this live stream, thank you for joining me. Um, we will wait for the uh, three minutes up to uh, finish and um, after that I think I will finish uh, and end that live stream because it's way past midnight and I'm a bit tired and I have to say I really really enjoyed that stream. I enjoy hanging out with you, answering questions and asking questions and just get in touch with everyone in the community. It's such a cool thing to do. And Darkos there. Hi there. Tonight we'll dream of the new. <laughs> and from the atoms. Yeah, from where we formed. That's a cool thing, isn't it? I really like that idea. Well, thanks for being here with me in this chat and within this stream. And I'm hoping that the uh, three minute long exposure will reveal some more details of that uh, faint and distant galaxy, even though being one of the brightest objects in the night sky. And there it is. Look at that. I think, I think that's cool. I even do an auto stretch. Oh no, that looks horrible. Okay, and this is the Andromeda galaxy. Now you can see the inner inner core. You can clearly see the dust lanes, the 
um, high contrast dust lanes of uh, darker non-illuminated dust that blocks the light from the uh, stars behind and give this uh, galaxy its typical and very iconic look and uh, people out there have spent hours and hours and decades and decades <laughs> on imaging this galaxy it's a, it's a marvel in the night sky and you see the two companion galaxies down at the bottom and in the upper right corner and this is a cool thing folks we just imaged this image it's a single three minute exposure it's three minutes worth of light we collected with our telescope just right now within this little backyard of mine and it's this is why why i love this hobby so much we can see so much cool things up in the night sky that we wouldn't be aware of if it wasn't for astronomy and the awe and the gazing towards the night sky. Yeah, okay, so this is the end of the live stream. I again thank all of you for participating within this live stream. It was so cool, it, it was a fun thing to do I will definitely do another live stream maybe again with a, a list you can pre-wish maybe I'll put together a, a pre-selected list of objects that I can image so that I don't need to search through the night sky while imaging even though I thought this is a fun thing as well um yeah it's so weird to think that something 2.5 million light years away is considered a neighbor yeah it is a close neighbor i don't know it's it's one of the closest things in the universe to us this is really 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 weird <laughs> so and nico thanks again thanks for participating and rob and darko as well so everyone Clear skies to everyone. I hope you have clear skies and not bad weather and that you get outside and gaze at the stars yourself. And um, yeah, have a good time, have a good night. Thanks for participating within this stream and um, bye everyone. <laughs>